Hello, everybody. Very nice to see you all this afternoon, coming, cutting your lunch short for this conversation about commissioning contemporary art. My name is Louisa Buck. I work for the art newspaper, and I've also published a book on commissioning contemporary art of the same name. And with reference to that, but, but particularly because of the issues that it raises, it's really fantastic to have with me Tom Eccles, who's Executive Director, Centre for Curatorial Studies at Bard, at Bard College in New York, and the collector Cesar Ami Marias from Puerto Rico. And it's particularly exciting because what, what they both, what they, what they actually symbolise are two very different kind of aspects of commissioning contemporary art because Cesar and Riaz have actually, not, not content with having a few lovely artworks commissioned by artists, they've actually commissioned an entire beach house from Jorge Pardo in Puerto Rico and are now about to um, commission or in the process of finishing up another commission from Mr. Pardo for a beautiful house in Mexico City. So I want, I'm sorry, not in Yucatan, Mexico, in Merida. So it'll be very good in a minute we're going to be seeing some images of that. Whereas Tom Eccles in nearly a decade um, working for the Public Art Trust, the Public Art Fund in New York, had innumerable commissions that he's going to be showing us some pictures of in the public realm, very many different types, from monuments to parades to artworks. And now at Bard College, amongst other, amongst other artists doing residencies and creating commissions, is Oliver Larsen, who's produced a really extraordinary uh, permanent piece. His first major outdoor piece, is it, I think? But, yeah. First major permanent outdoor piece, which also Tom's going to be showing us. So I think to kick off, if you could get the, get the images rolling, it would be nice to see some examples of, of Cesar and Mima's um, yeah. Cesar and Mima's house. Mm -hmm. Are we rolling now? That's fantastic. Okay, mm -hmm. Which is what we're seeing here. And perhaps you could uh, just kind of talk us through a little what we're seeing. Well, this is the... They're just shots of different angles of the house. Uh, I think they speak for themselves. The house is in the southern, southeastern part of Puerto Rico, just about in front of the ocean, but on a hill about 200 feet high. And uh, you're just seeing very bad photographs of the interior. <laughs> but you can still, they're still good enough to make us all quite <laughs> jealous, though. <laughs> But I think what's interesting is that they are, I mean, they're a home, they're a house, you have friends there, you have children there, you have animals there, yeah. but it's very much This is the Merida an house artwork. in Mexico. Now in, now in Merida, yeah. But actually the same principles apply, do they not? That, you know, you've got, it's a place for living, but it's also exactly. very much an art installation as well. So it's a yeah. livable yeah. installation. Now this is almost this is almost completed. I mean, he's still working on the final touches here, isn't he? So it's, I would say it's almost, finished. It's just a, a few uh, elements and furniture and lamps, but it's basically all finished. But I think what's interesting is it's more than decor. It's actually Pardo's, it's, it's Pardo's language. I mean, it's his language with ceramic. It's his language with abstract form. So you very much got the sense of it being an actual artwork rather than a lovely piece of decorative activity that he's done on a house yeah. that, you've, that you own. Yeah. No, it's, it's definitely an, art, an artwork, but he's, he's also, I think he, he's also uh, integrated his style of living, which is very similar to ours, and uh, he's made a house that he would feel comfortable living in himself. And, uh, and it is an artwork, but it's also very much a house, a home. And the first one we, we built from scratch, and this one is an interior remodelation that Jorge did. This was a Spanish colonial house in the center of Merida. So he, this one he intervened in, within the existing structure. The first one we built from scratch. So with the beach house, in fact, it was, I mean, a, a tabula rasa. You had a piece of land. Exactly. So you really were creating something from absolutely nothing, mm -hmm. yeah, which yeah. must have been quite a scary experience as well, <laughs> as, a, as, well as an exhilarating one. Yeah, well, I, I've always thought that he was very gutsy in he had never done that before in saying that he was going to, he, that he had no problem in doing it. And, and it came out incredible. Well, I'm going to be talking more about the issues surrounding the act of commissioning, but I think it was really wonderful to be able to get images. So when we talk about the two houses, 
now your audience have, have the images in your head a bit to be able to see what we're talking about. And I'm going to do the same thing with Tom, really, just to, just to get some images now just rolling of, of previous projects. So, you know, you could talk us through a little as they come by, by Tom, but just to give us a sort of sense of, of the spectrum of the works that you've been active in commissioning. So, again, when we talk about the issues surrounding commissioning, we've then got some visual examples. So if we could start rolling these images now. Sorry, this is, a, this is another presentation. That's okay. I, we don't so want fear and loathing either. I was the uh, <laughs> director of the Public Art Fund um, uh, for about 10 years, from the mid-90s to uh, you know, 2005, where I, I ran a foundation. It was a foundation called the Public Art Fund, but it was neither public nor a fund. In fact, uh, <laughs> and uh, I became director quite young, and I, I realized that um, I was in the wrong job. I didn't actually like public art in any form whatsoever. <laughs> and, uh, and so I tried to invert you know, public art or, or you know, site-specific work or you know, commissioning art often starts with, um, starts with a site, usually some kind of problem with that site that needs rectifying, and, 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 the, and, and, the, and the budget. Those, and, uh, and the budget is usually too small to rectify the problem. And, uh, uh, and some people said it's a wonderful opportunity for an artist. Um, and so we kind of said, okay, let's, let's invert that process altogether. Let's actually start with the artists themselves. In this case, Rachel Wyrie, now young artist Chris Doyle. Um, let's change the pro process around all, all together. Start with the artist, start with, uh, sort of, uh, and then start looking at their work and then thinking about their work within an urban context and how it might function. Uh, uh, how art can function in a different way within an urban context, but still maintain its uh, specificity as an artwork. You know, because often within the commissioning process, the work becomes kind of watered down. So, and often for very various reasons, whether they're political reasons, um, financial reasons, uh, you know, artistic problems. Um, you know, public art or, or commissioned work can often be a kind of reduced form of artistic practice. So my attitude to it was like, actually, let's, let's really make this not the most problematic, but actually the most kind of um, fantastic experience for an artist as a way to explore their work, hopefully on a one-time basis within the public realm, whatever that public realm uh, actually is, or whatever that issue within their work uh, that can be explored within the public context that will actually kind of drive it uh, in a way that wouldn't be possible within the gallery context. So actually using all the kind of mechanisms of commissioning to actually really think through uh, an artist's work. So, you know, um, and actually what is possible outside of the, outside of the gallery context or outside of the, the kind of art world context. So, um, But also to subvert the monumental, we're seeing Tony Ursula here, you know, with one thinks of public sculpture, public commissions as sort of you know, lumps of stuff on plinths, but even when they're on a plinth, in the case of the Coon's puppy here, it's, a fla it's flowers, they're, they're ghostly voices in the case of the Ursula. So in a way, you're kind of critiquing the whole notion of public art while actually also expanding the artist's potential within that field. Well, there's also, the, there's also this issue that it, it's not really so much about monumentality, even though there, a lot of this was kind of a critique of monumentality, even though a lot of it was actually monumental, at least balls by Takashi Murakami of a Rockefeller Center. But it was also about making public statements, like this is public space, you know, it's kind of, it was very interesting, my time in New York City where public space was becoming more and more privatized. Mm -hmm. More and more privatized. It might look public, function publicly, but actually it's pri privatized space. So to ask questions that I think were kind of pertinent in their own time, to actually move away from permanence Altogether, in this case of the, of the Francis Alice parade we just seen, Francis Alice yeah. parade, but also the fact of like this exhibition by Franz West, for example. Here's a, this really is playing with the notion of the turd on the plaza. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So they, they had a kind of. I think they had a kind of. Even though a lot of these projects were kind of sculptural in form, were activist in spirit, and I think people knew at the time that this, this is Paul McCarthy's daddy's big head. People knew that this was a kind of really a truly alternative vision of, of uh, the role of the artist within, within our 
sort of public society. And this continues now at Bard College. We're looking now at your Oliver Elias. And this Elias uh, project by Oliver Elias is called Parliamentary Reality. Parliamentary yes. Reality, which is something, again, you, I mean, it's, this is permanent, but it's a kind of perambulatory, it was a perambulatory piece. You walk through, there are places to sit. In a way, he kind of orchestrated the environment in a very interesting way. Yeah, I mean, almost with the, with the permanent work, it's, it's almost kind of more interesting to make a work that uh, it doesn't really matter if it's artwork or not. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. Mima and Cesar's house with Jorge. Yeah. Like, it's the most kind of in incredible experience of, 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 of lived space. Mm. And it, you kind of you forget that this is a work by Jorge Pardo. <laughs> and then, you know? And then, or well, certainly I forgot it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I think that's we have kind of, ways of I making think, you forget. Exactly, <laughs> and that, that's kind of in, that's sort of interesting in the commissioning living kind of process. Well, I think particularly with permanence, because I mean now commissioned work. And when I started writing this book, I thought, oh, it'll be a shoe in. You know, lots of people commission. It's a very interesting way to talk. But actually, the, the field has expanded so greatly now. Where, whereby one has events, one has, one has um, commissions with biennales, commissions with individuals, commissions with institutions, commissions domestically, foundation-wise. I mean, it is such an exploded kind of field mm -hmm. that actually I think it's, it's, quite, you know, it's, it's quite a challenge sometimes to, to deal with, with it. But the temporality, a lot of commissions are temporary, so they can be very throat-grabbing. But permanent commissions are problematic because they can't be a permanent imposition, but one doesn't want them to be invisible either, particularly in the public realm. They have, to be, they have to be adaptable, like the Franz West you're talking about, to actually continue to have a sort of life after their initial installation. What? They might be there for decades. The house might be there for decades. Mm -hmm. So to make it a living space is very important, I think. Yeah. But there's a, the issue of conservation also. How, mm -hmm. do you make, uh, how did you make those sculptures uh, last? The, yeah, but I used to say, like, it's funny, with the Percent for Art program in New York, for example, right? Um, you know, they're, they're terrified of maintenance. Terrified. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people kind of commission artworks, pub, pu public institutions often commission artworks with no sense. They, they'd say, oh, it's, it's got to be, we, we can't put any money into maintenance. And I'd say to, say to them, well, you know, you clean your toilet. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, like, you know, like if this is the most important thing, <laughs> You know, then you have to kind of commit to that, you know, if you believe this is important, then you'll do this. Yeah, we have a whole you know? chapter, we have a whole chapter. Otherwise, the you, you know, yeah. you, there's a whole thing with public art, it's sort of like all these kind of constraints and people go, rrr, rrr, rrr. and so ultimately you end up with this tile work with no meaning whatsoever sitting in the, you know, on the, on the yeah. wall. Like, I'm not, and you've actually diminished everything you, uh, every aspiration you had for why you make an artwork. So I was like, well, look, you know, part of this is like, you know, you, you ne when you start out making the work, you're really unsure what it will, what will come out to the other end. That people say, that's the most exciting part of it. Mm. Producing the work together with an artist, you know, it's really, it really is a kind of fundamental, exciting process. But you don't know the result. The result actually might be kind of hugely successful. Then actually, then you keep it. And, it, and societies are very good at cleaning out what they don't want, mm. you know? A Darwinian and process, that's yeah. That's a Darwinian process. I think that's, that's actually fundamentally right, no? Like, I didn't want to, and now I'm kind of getting older, so now I'm kind of sad that a lot of these things don't exist. <laughs> but that's, a, that's part of getting older, you know? But actually, uh, it's... I, I always had this fear of leaving too much stuff around. No, we, I mean, we, yeah. we have, a whole, I have a whole chapter in the book about the afterlife of the artwork for that purpose, because mm -hmm. yes, you yeah. make the commission, but then, you know, if a commission's a permanent one, it does remain, or if it doesn't remain, the documentation is the only record that it had. But I think, you know, I'm going to go back to the beginning a bit, because no, this is the also end of it all. It's important, I think, like, sort of like, in these cases, you know, these are, these are sort of permanent, temp these are temporary public projects. Yeah which actually in the context of Miami Art Fair, it's kind of interesting that actually I thought that they, um, it was very important that ultimately they found permanent homes in private collections. Mm. And then ultimately they might come back into the public realm later. Like for example, Jeff Kuhn's puppy, yeah. we, 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 you know, we commissioned the frame, we paid for the flowers, did the whole thing. Ultimately, uh, and it was there for three months, you know? Then it went to, then Peter Brandt bought it. It's now sitting in Greenwich. Looks fantastic. Ultimately, I would hope that Peter would then give it back to a public mm -hmm. location. You know, so this kind of temper, like 
Well, there's so many different forms of commission now because institutions now, of course, commission with Monumenta, for example, in Paris or the Turbine Hall in the Tate. That's another way of getting... I mean, there's... A, it, 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 but I, I want to go back to the reasons why commission because, of course, it's one of the earliest means of acquiring art. Traditionally, you know, the, the art market came later. Artwork was commissioned for specific use. And I mean, the various myriad reasons why, and of course they do all overlap, but it seems to me really crucial is the relationship with the artist. It seems to be why, even whether, whether you're a public curator, a private individual, you get that particular relationship with an artist. You're there as part of the process of the creative act, you have an inside view that you wouldn't normally get. And I think perhaps that, does that apply on both sides of the spectrum? I mean, certainly well, privately, sure. that's important I mean, the, for you, isn't from it? The, from the beginning, when, when we bought the land, the idea was that we didn't want to use a traditional designer and architect to do the, the work. And uh, I, I had had uh, friendships with artists already, and I, and I thought it would be great to have uh, somebody who worked with with space and design to do the house. And it's a completely different experience because I've tried sometimes to do things with architects and the way they function is totally different than, than with an artist. So what's the difference? Tell me, with, well, when, uh, what's your experience? Well, they, they, it's, it's, more, uh, it's more rigid. They, they have a, a percentage that they, that they, a percentage fee for designing, a percentage fee for building, it's all very concrete and and, uh, and and rigid. It doesn't move much from that. With Jorge, it was basically, he, he thought up a plan. He said, okay, I'm going to charge you so much for it, and that was it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and as problems ar arose, we would yeah. deal with them, but all in part of the original budget. So the budget, well, that's, <laughs> that's the same with architects, <laughs> yeah. though, isn't it? An architect would start uh, Everything to... Everything already thought to, uh, after. To uh, charge you hour-wise, even for phone calls and stuff like that, it's much more complicated. And, and the way he, the way he resolved, for example, something very surprising about the house in Naguabo is the grates, which is a crucial element because it gives you security. Yeah, it's an open house, but then you you need security. But you have no windows, do you? It's we no. have it's we have no windows in the which house. Is, but you need so protection also. You need protection, and then the way he resolved it with those circle grates and also the color he chose for the grates, that orange, which is like. I mean, totally, we haven't thought about that possibility. And yeah. that's one of the elements of that house that really impresses everybody who goes there. So it's a much more fluid, yeah. a much more much fluid more relationship, but you, also of, uh, make relationship. A leap, but you also make a leap of faith, because of course, with an architect, there are certain kind of protocols. It's, it's a, it's a with gamble. an artist, Yeah, you're, it was a leap of faith. It's, it's open. a gamble. <laughs> I mean, originally, we wanted something very modest, and possibly with wood, made out of wood. <laughs> and he had completely different You've got idea something rather large head. with concrete. <laughs> and we just went with him. And the other, the other interesting thing is an, an architect has a time frame he has to work with. And with, with Jorge, we, uh, we let him take whatever time he needed. Some things were resolved like three years down the line. Like there was a big triangular hole in the, in the ceiling of the house by the, by the sea that uh, he hadn't resolved how he was going to cover that. So it would rain and <laughs> rain the, inside the house for a few years. And Oops. then eventually he came up with a very simple uh, solution to the problem. But I don't think if I, if I had pressed him early on, I know you have to, you have to uh, finish the, the design for this, we need this. He might have not come up with something as beautiful as. You wouldn't what have got such. Up. Now, Tom, I'm obviously if you're commissioning in the public realm, however subversive you're trying to be, however much you're trying to give artists freedom, you have different kinds of parameters. If you've mm -hmm. got city authorities down your neck, if you've got that kind of that kind of remit, so it must be difficult. I mean, on the one hand, stimulating to be involved with the artist, but on the other hand, more of a headache to try and square that circle. I'd imagine of artistic leap of faith and creative flow, but also health and safety, city authorities, all that other yeah. stuff that you have I to mean, consider in the public you, realm. I, you know, I, think, I think one of the things you have to do, and I think you did it with, Hawke is a kind of unique case, because he knows how to build things, yeah. you know? That you does know, help, yeah. He knows yeah. how to build house. actual things, yeah. houses, you know? Um, my attitude to all of this was that we had to provide this kind of support mechanism and expertise that could allow an artist to make a work on that kind of scale in that kind of place. Right. 
So you're, you're an enabler, kind of, basically. You're more like a movie production company. Right. You know? Yep. And you're kind of running a movie. So you have a whole set of different people who are actually uh, ultimately realizing the work. Then you've got to be, you know, I think like one of the things with artists is that um, they think about what's above ground. You know? So they kind of <laughs> think about what well, it is you actually well, people will engage. See. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, the expensive stuff is really below ground. Mm. You know, like it's really expensive. New York, like digging up a sidewalk in New York City is really expensive. Yeah. And, uh, and if you screw up, it's super expensive, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, I think when you're commissioning an artist, you know, like, then you say, okay, we'll take all of that on. Like, we'll do all of that. Otherwise, I think artists become weird engineers, architects, they sort of diminish what they do. So I think you need to take all that kind of pressure on. You also have to be super realistic and, or, Super honest in terms of what in terms of what you can do, what you mm. can't do, you know, um, and uh, from the get go, and you start with a budget. Tell the artist you've got fifty percent of that budget. You got mm. two hundred thousand, yeah. so we've got a budget of a hundred thousand. Yeah. Uh, You'll end up spending two fifty, you know, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and that's really important. I think that the, the budgetary thing that these are the sort of being really super honest. What you can can't do. What the what the permissions process actually is, you know, people get carried away, and you know, and also, you know, things change. So, be, I said to my predecessor, sort of, um, you know, you're not the camel; you're the fly on the back of the camel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you if you get that right, you'll be okay. But you're not running the show. You know, yeah. you're just trying to make sure we keep going in the right direction. But that's and very challenging. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to, because the artist, the show is the artist's creativity. Right. You're the enabler, but you've also got to make sure it actually happens. Absolutely. So, that's, so, so you're that's actually like, I think, and also, the artist is putting in a huge, these projects take a huge amount of uh, work on the part of the artist, often taking them away from their studio practice, mm. you know? And, and actually sometimes transformative in terms of their studio practice. Like, a lot of these commissioning projects actually mean that an artist has to take on much larger kind well, of liability. Well, artists often want to, be, of, want to be commissioned so that they yes. can actually explore new avenues. Yeah. It enables them to open up new areas of practice they'd never be doing it before. So they're taking a leap of faith yeah, too. Yeah, but it can also become a kind of weird, addictive... It's a bit like taking Ambien or something, right? <laughs> like, you know? Uh, uh, or I could think of some other drugs. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, uh, you know, that what happens is people, artists get these commissions, they've set up a studio, they have studio assistants, they have technical advisors, they've ha now they have operating costs they never had before. So then they take on another commission. And so, uh, and then they take on another commission. And I, I've, I've, I always said to artists, do one commission every 10 years. Don't, and, and stop, you know? Uh, because it will finish you. It'll, it, uh, I've seen it ruin really good artists who suddenly become problem solvers. Suddenly they're, well, suddenly they're doing a commission for they? the convention center in Miami, yeah. which doesn't need a public artwork or a, or a commissioned but, artwork. But I think what's interesting now is the field has expanded. I mean, you're talking about a very particular kind of commission work, but now it seems to me that commissioning has really expanded. So that, I mean, there's quite a lot of artists who actually get themselves commissioned because that's their means of practice. I'm thinking of Jeremy Della, for example, with street parades, with reenactments, with works in the community. I'm yeah. thinking of artists who work on a residency basis, or artists like Armin Link, for example, who actually needs to be commissioned. He did an extraordinary um, link called an uh, uh, extraordinary series called Il Corpo del Stato, where he actually was doing a, he was doing a um, commission for the Museum of Modern Art in Rome, and he got himself commissioned to photograph all the secret institutional spaces for a project about how the state architecture and these extraordinary palazzi shape the kind of you know the, the, the corridors of power. But he would never have got that without the kind of official commission. So artists are getting quite nifty at, at being able to kind of extend their practice themselves through commission, mm -hmm. not becoming site managers necessarily, or having residences or research-based work. It seems to be very much a trend at the moment mm -hmm. that this is taking place. Mm -hmm. Have you come across this at all? With, 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 I mean, privately as a collector, probably not quite so much. It's more of an institutional thing, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I think, I think uh, any artist, the, the, the dream would be to make uh, to have a commission to make something large scale, to do uh, whatever they want to do, not thinking necessarily of 
of a gallery show or or a market or just being given the, the freedom to do what they want in a large mm. scale. And uh, I, I can't see like a, an artist wanting to do one every 10 years if they get the chance. I think it depends so much on, but I think it's interesting that you've got artists, I mean, Peter Doig, for example, Chris mm -hmm. who aren't artists that do commissions. I mean, painters often don't, I mean, experimental avant-garde painters. Well, they, they and then they both, they both did it for you as a, as a particular kind of special, yeah. mm. special case. Not, they, they've done, uh, Peter did uh, something for uh, Westminster Abbey for a, a backdrop for a concert, and 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 Chris did the, the Royal Ballet. Yes, but they were they were temporary, yeah. temporary. I mean, that's the first thing that they in do a performative like that. context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and of course there's Performer, the Performer Biennial, which Rosalie Goldberg runs, which allows artists to work in a completely different kind of in different kind of medium but why do you think Tom it is I mean you've got the Center of Curatorial Studies you have artists in residence doing commissions on site yep. and it's you know again it's become part of the kind of education process yep. in a way that it just wasn't before I don't think yeah I mean I think um, I mean there's different levels of commissioning too right mm. so that there is I mean it's kind of interesting these things I say performer where they're commi new commissions but there's not but in a way, like the artists, the galleries are also, the, you know, they're making the work, paying for the work. The financing of the whole project is quite different from a sort of traditional notion of the well, they commission. they all overlap right? now, don't they? All these different, I mean, I, I had six commissioning models in the book. I mean, it was right. institutions, private foundations, domestic, for private individuals, yeah. events, public realm, and agencies. And of course, they all overlap. You know, they're not distinct mm. at all. Actually, you might have a piece that's um, commissioned by an institution. A private individual might also play a part. An agency might be involved, right. and it might then end up in the public realm. But so you have all these different. Maybe that's not a function of like commissioning per se, but more like that's just how art is made, right? That's but but like, now, particularly, I yeah, think, yeah, and like even museum structures, or you know, you said the Tate. I used to do the shows at the Park Avenue Armory, where. Uh, you know, like you can't just take work from a studio and show it at the Park Avenue Armory. The danger, I think, is, is kind of like, um, the danger is that like there's a kind of gigantism happening. Yeah. Like, right? like, kind of like, and, then, and then also artwork becomes a kind of experience. And I, I wonder kind of like, um, it can you know, feed ultimately into the, where it goes. Yeah. It can feed into the megalomania of some artists yeah. to do gigantic things. You know, and what, what, you know, like I think, um, you know, then it fits also with the notion that museums should be bigger and bigger and build, build, build these big spaces, that's it, then they need to fill these big spaces. Well, it becomes so, quite stadium rock, doesn't it, really? Yeah. Rather and, than um, the old acoustic sets. It becomes <laughs> very event driven in some ways. Yeah. Um, and again, this idea of the kind of experience, I think, is, is sort of like, you know, could. Uh, you know, for example, like, you know, when I first started at the Public Art Fund, there was a site, I showed an image of it, a site at the uh, Flatiron building on, on 23rd Street, Fifth Avenue, Broadway. And the people used to put these big sculptures there. It's the most terrible place to put big sculptures because the real sculpture is the... The building. Is the Flatiron building. Yeah. And also, like, and also we had no money whatsoever, you know. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I talked to an artist called Ilya Kabakov, and we talked about kind of could we do a pathetic sculpture? <laughs> you know, like, I love and, that uh, idea. And so we did a piece called Monument to the Lost Glove that literally was just a little glove in the ground. You know, and the commissioner kept saying, I'm not giving you a permit for your giant glove. As I know, it's small as a glove, you know. They were like, I'm not giving you a permit for that rubbernecking problem. That's and right. It's literally, because you know, the expectation of it was, was something. But it was also like, I wanted like something like you literally tripped over. You know, and was quizzical and problematic, and was like, was like chewing gum on the bottom of your shoe. Tracy Emin did that you also know? with discarded children's clothes yeah. in Folkestone, um, like a little booty or a glove put on a railing. Yeah, but of course, it was bronze. Adriana Lara yeah. with the banana peel. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So I kind of worry a little bit about it's like kind of, it's like art at the Olympics. Like, there's nothing well, really worse than art at the Olympics. You know, what, what, like why there's a, you know, so you get this kind of these giant things that sort of, they're supposed to celebrate something, you're not really too sure what they are. You know, like I, the, the Vatican, I, I went to the Vatican a while ago and they said, we want to do a, um, 
we want to do a pavilion um, at the, the Venice Biennale. Venice Biennale, that's right, yeah. You know, what do you advise? I said, well, you've got a pavilion. It's called St. Mark's Cathedral, you know? And mm. actually, you know, and they said, we want to commission art, but we don't want it to be controversial. And I was like, you've got the best controversial art <laughs> ever made, <laughs> you know? Like, so, so do, you, do you think there's a kind of addiction then towards commissioning in the public as, as a kind of logo and branding of, of an event that you know you have to have some new artwork put in the public realm to validate what you're doing then. to validate to validate your the Venice Biennale your your presence there for example oh, or absolutely. if you're a museum or an institution rather than quietly collecting for your holdings you throw a big a big event in your in your public space. No, absolutely. I think, but I, I, is that good or I bad? I worry a bit about sort of instrumentalization. You know, mm. I mean, I mean, my students always talk about instrumentalization. You know, but like, I, you know, it's kind of sad to see this BMW car in the VIP lounge saying, "Protect me from what I want" by Jenny Holzer. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you're like, it's awful, and it's sort of like it's like. Uh, it's, I don't know, I find it, I find it like a, a artist are becoming quite um, compromised by all of this. But I think it's... I and think it's not for me, the idea that everyone's commissioning art is kind of slightly terrifying, actually. But I think the whole notion, I mean, I wanted to actually just, because then, then we'll throw the, throw, throw the floor open for questions, but it is nonetheless, it is, it is a very interesting way, if you do do it, and not in a gigantic, crazed branding way, as we discussed, it is, a very, it is an extraordinary way to be able to have contact with artists, to be able to enable them to do projects they wouldn't be able to do otherwise, and enable you, if you're a private collector, to acquire something that you would never normally have. So, I mean, I, I think it's interesting that more people do seem to be doing it. We've got a whole front page on the art newspaper on portraiture, for example. But, you know, more and more people are, are there alternative forms of portrait. I know that you have, a, you have a Tobias Ryberg, a portrait of you and your family as flowers in vases, you know, Felix Gonzalez. Les Torres portraits I'm thinking of as piles of sweets. Yeah. So different forms of commemoration. It's still worth doing. But are there any tips that you'd say as to why, as, as, to, as, to, as to, to do or to don't in the forms of commissioning? Mm -hmm. mm. What you would do, what you wouldn't do, what you'd advise anybody who's thinking of, of commissioning? Yeah, it depends on the artist because some artists, they really don't like you to like, ask directly. It just yeah. has like a, bit, like a process that flows. Yeah, I, think. I mean, it's, yeah. Not, it's not a question that, that we really uh, ask ourselves. Yeah. It's just something that ha happens. It's like an organic. For Elias, we had seen that he had done uh, an exhibition, I think at Neugat Rimschneider, of vases of his friends. Uh, it was Wolfgang Tillmans and uh, Michel Magyarus. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we didn't know if he was doing it, you know, apart from that series. And we just asked him, oh, you know, would you do that a vase for us? And, and that's how it happened. But we never, we, we never really uh, think about, uh, you know, who would we ask or not. It just flows. So it's an organic, it's an organic yeah. process yeah. coming and, out of your relationship with the artist. And that's how also the beach house, uh, the idea came out. I and mean, it was something that just popped up during, during the Mon Monster Sculpture Fair where we yeah. met Jorge. We met him there yeah. in the pier he did. And it was some. We had already the land well, that we have bought. You met monster, didn't you? But yes. it's not yeah. some idea that just says her pop up, you know, out of the blues. Yeah. Would you made a beach house yeah. for me. We and hadn't gone to monster to to find. No, you were on the pier. You were on his pier, yeah. weren't you, yes. at monster? Yeah. yeah. And then he saw. All, we saw all this beautiful thing he's made, and we thought about, wow, the land we have. This would be a great idea. But it just happened there. It was not that we went there with this in mind. No, no, you know, sure. So, yeah. so, so but, but as far as you're concerned, I mean, inviting artists to come to Bard, engaging, as you say, in these very ticklish topics where there is this sort of notion of, of gigantism and of people commissioning for all kinds of reasons that perhaps aren't as lofty as we might like. So you're, you're teaching students, you're actively you know, involved in shaping the curators of the future. Mm -hmm. what, are, what advice are you giving them about commissions and how are you selecting artists to come to interact with the with the students, <laughs> your eyes are widening. <laughs> <laughs> say, get a contract, <laughs> you know? Get a contract. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Number one, I was like, actually, you know, in terms of the commissioning process, I think it's actually, I mean, it's very important that one has a kind of fundamental trust between the commissioner, and, okay, you know, yes. and, and the artist. Mm -hmm. 
but it's also really important to be really clear about it, yeah. you know? And, um, and uh, money is clarity, right? And, um, and contracts are really interesting. There's a really interesting moment. I tend to move with contracts very quickly. It's really clear, it's in writing, what you're gonna do, you know? And I think these, these processes get very, very complex if you don't come to that point of clarity. Like, you know, I can be friends with all kinds of artists, but when they're looking at a contract, they're looking at their own. Yeah, fair enough, know, the, yeah. What, what's the deal? And, uh, you know, you can do the deal over drinks and dinner and this, but like sitting there in the morning with the, with the piece of paper is really important. What's super important is actually it's not, it doesn't benefit you at all. It's totally, it's all about the artist. Like, mm -hmm. a lot of people give artists contracts, they think now we're, now we're home and dry, we now have a deal. <laughs> Whoever sued an artist, mm -hmm. do you know? What, well, what, what Mass life, Mocha and Christoph Buchel, well, I suppose. Christoph Buchel, but didn't do Mass Mocha any good. <laughs> no, it did not. And, yeah. uh, and they never had a contract. And so I think that's, that's a really <laughs> interesting, well, I think yeah. even if they had a contract, they still yeah. wouldn't have had an artwork, Yeah. you know? And so it's kind of really, it's a really interesting moment. It's, it's the opposite of legally what you would think Constitution mm -hmm. agreement, and uh, so, and I also and think, I also think signing. with which said if you specify what it is you're doing, mm. it'll be really clear what it is you want out of this, mm. you know, mm. um, from the get-go. Now those can expand, but be as hard as possible on yourself. It also makes you, as a commissioner, really think through what your kind of authority is, what your resources are. Um, what the, why you want to commission this particular artist. And also you have to think specifically about that artist's work. Like, you know, um, there's this kind of very funny thing I think that happens in the commissioning process that, you, you know, people start out with these very grand ideas of why they're doing this and it's great optimism and, um, and then they get their proposal mm -hmm. and there's like, this kind of weird letdown <laughs> moment, right? It's happened to me with every artist I've ever worked with. Kind of like, oh. And, and then you get the artwork well, a itself. A letdown from the commissioner, you mean? Yeah, yeah, for the commissioner. But then ultimately the work rises to being an artwork. Yeah. Do you know? But I think the artists, I interviewed a lot of artists in this book, and all of them, great and small, said, you never know till you've built it. Exactly. You know, there's that weird, there's the alchemy of its physical yeah. presence. And yeah. whether it's a parade or, you know, Anish Kapoor, great big skyscape, doesn't, yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So, you know, you're all, you're all taking a punt, really, aren't you? You're all taking a gamble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, you, know, you never know what's going to happen at the yeah. end. Mm -hmm. But you just, you know, just use your intuition and see all the works that the, the artist has done. As, a, as an example. Well, we've had some good advice now from the, from the panel. Would anybody like to ask some questions? We've got time time for a few questions from the, from the audience. There's a roving mic. Come on, we've got these great people here. Not for very long. <laughs> Lady at the front. Thank you. What kind of artists do you commission when you're looking for, for artists or for artwork projects? I'm sorry, so what that... kind of artists do you commission when you're looking for artwork projects? So what's what your criteria? Is it? What yeah, you, exactly. What's your criteria for selecting an artist? Um, well, it depends. What's the criteria? I like that artist. <laughs> you know, like, it's actually kind of like, it's actually the same criteria of doing an exhibition with an artist or, you know, it's like there's something interesting about that specific artist. I have very diverse tastes, so, you know, um, but it's, it's very, very rare that I commission an artist because of public work. You know, like I, I rarely worked with an artist because I'd seen a public project by them or like seen a commissioned work by them at some form. And so I imagine also you've got to you've got to have it in your guts that they're going to be able to pull it off too. Uh, a lot of us I work with who couldn't pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm actually quite interested in working with us who can't pull it off. Like I think it's actually kind of like what I was saying about um, the fact that these become collaborative projects. Mm. You know, you don't want an artist to. I was just in a meeting this morning and there was a, uh, a meeting a gentleman about commissioning a, a, a sculptural work and. You know, it's like his big question, question was whether the artist could actually make this happen. And I was like, well, you know, 
we can put a man on the moon, I think we can make this <laughs> up. You know, like, have, you know, you, have, you had, be a have you had uh, commissions that didn't get to the end, that you had to, that got Never for technical, no, never for technical reasons or financial reasons. Um, okay. The ones that didn't happen probably shouldn't have happened, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Gentleman here. Hi, uh, um, I hope this doesn't sound like piling on Jenny Holzer, but yeah, I was totally struck by the, the vehicle that, it, it almost seems like she, she lent her integrity of her work to, she, she gave up the integrity of the work to, to at a certain level. Um, it's, a, it's understandable in a certain way that she's, she's reached a point in her career where she could certainly cash in by a, by a commission like this. But, but uh, it's, it's almost she subverted the value of her work by giving it over to the very sort of uh, idea that she was trying to put across. So for an artist, where do they draw the line? What's your advice to drawing the line in terms of, uh, on the other hand, it's a natural thing that, you know, in terms of her career to, to be able to um, generate that kind of commission from it. Sorry for the scrambled I'm question. Quite, I'm but quite old-fashioned, actually. You know, I'm sort of, I'm quite old-fashioned in this. I, I actually think artists should be autonomous agents, you know? And the work should have some autonomy, you know? And, um, uh, you know, a lot of people don't think that. I mean, we, we're in a sort of, we live in a kind of, collab, sort of collaborative moment, you know? And, uh, um, but I think there is something unique that artists bring to the world. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but I think you know it when you see it. And it's worth, it's worth ironically, in Jenny's case, protecting, you know? And I don't know, I don't think it's about, I don't think it's about money. I, I don't really care whether people make lots of money, don't make lots of money. I care if they don't make lots of money, but you know, it's like, I don't really care if an artist makes, it makes a good living or doesn't make a good living. You know, it's, a, it's the artwork itself that is kind of autonomous to that, you know? Uh, but that's what kind of worries me about a lot of these kind of projects, that they become, they become a diminishing of the role of, uh, you think they're actually kind of ex an expanded feel of art in our world, but actually for me, somewhat diminish the importance of art in, in our society. We've got time for one more question. Uh, lady at the back. Hello? Laurie? Couldn't wave, play. Uh, this is for Tom. I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the collaboration with Olafur Eliasson at Bard, because um, it seems to be a very special commission that uh, is not only for a public institution, but it benefits its students, it's permanent, and um, I'm sure that it was complicated to a certain degree because it was, I'm sure you had a time limit, you had budget constricts, constrictions, and you had a patron. You just talk a little bit about Yeah, I mean, actually, in terms of commissioning, I think it's kind of interesting that there's a process, um, you know, you start working with an artist, and with Oliver, it was almost 10 years in the, in the process of talking through his work, that to do these very large-scale permanent projects, you, you know, Lucy talked about kind of you kind of commit to something which you're unsure of the outcome. You actually have to do a lot of research and expend quite a lot of uh, time and money in order to get to the point whether you can understand uh, mm -hmm. what's involved in making a work. And it's a very difficult, I think that's a difficult process. In the case of Oliver, we wanted to make a lake, an island on a lake, um, you know, and then circular trees around that space that wasn't sort of, was actually about a place where people could actually uh, you know, spend time in dialogue, uh, in argument, a kind of place where you know, young students would meet, students, professors would meet, lovers would meet. Uh, that wasn't really about the thing, but about, it's about the, the place. meeting. Yeah, yeah. The place. about yeah. the, the human activity there. So, that, you know, it's kind of an interesting piece because you go there and there's nothing to look at. Mm. You know? Mm. There's no there there. It's about you know? activating the space. It's about activating you act exactly but actually, like your in, house. In the process of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but in the process of commissioning, we had to spend almost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to work out what it cost to make, <laughs> you know, to actually dig to make a lake, Incredible. you know, and and build an island. And uh, 
So it's a kind of like, and that, and that demanded people of real faith to come along on board. You know, it was all, it was entirely funded uh, um, privately by actually my Hoffman of the Luma Foundation. And uh, people with those kind of strong stomachs for that kind of commitment, uh, quite rare actually. Very rare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this is all I'm, I'm being signaled at. I think this is sadly all we have time for, but thank you very much indeed. Yeah. I will be signing copies of my book if anybody's interested in acquiring one. And I just want to thank my panelists very much indeed for such a terrific Great. conversation. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. And do look at Louise's book. Fantastic. Thank you. The book is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I paid them. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you.